The Sony ZV-E1 and the A7 IV both record footage in 422 10-bit color, which is an amazing feature, but I was a bit surprised to see that they're a bit different in how the footage actually looks. They both also perform extremely well in low-light situations. These two cameras are extremely popular amongst creators. They have a lot of similarities, they also have a lot of differences, and in reviewing all of that in detail, I'm gonna do my absolute best to help you decide which of these two cameras might be right for you. We're not only gonna be putting them head-to-head -head for video capabilities. We're also going to look at how they do for photography as well as some key features that both of these cameras have, followed by my recommendation on which one you should lean towards. Getting into comparing the video capabilities between these two cameras first, let's look at the codex. The high-end video-centric camera, the Sony a7S 3 first introduced a few codecs like XAVC SI and XAVC HS along with the Sony Classic XAVC S. It's nice to see that both the ZV-E1 and the A7 IV have all of these codecs as well. XAVC SI is arguably the highest quality, but also has the largest file sizes. XAVC HS is a H.265 file, so make sure that your computer can handle that, but it's technically a high quality file that's a lot smaller of a file size than XAVC SI. Lastly, we see XAVC S, my go-to, which is a H.264 file type, almost all all computers are going to be just fine with that type of file and I find it to be a really nice video quality and a smaller file size. The big feature that both of these cameras have is being able to shoot in 422 10-bit color, which I've noticed to be significantly better looking files compared to 8-bit. I'll show you a side-by-side -side comparison of how these two cameras render color in just one moment. Picture profiles. Both of these cameras have all of the standard Sony picture profiles like HLG and Cine. They both also have the desirable and new Newly introduced to Sony cameras at this price range of S Cinetone, which used to be reserved for the Sony cinema cameras. And S Log 3, which technically older Sony cameras did have S Log 3, but you want to get the most out of S Log 3 while using a camera that has 10 bit color, which both of these cameras have. Let's take a look at frame rates and resolution. In 1080p Full HD, both cameras can record in 24, 30, 60, and 120 frames per second. In 4K, the A7 IV can record in 24, 30, and 60p, but the ZV-E1 can record all of those and is also getting 120p in 4K in a firmware update that's supposed to come at some point in June 2023. What about crop factor? The ZV-E1 does not have a crop while shooting in 4K 60 and is only supposed to have a 10% crop when the firmware update gives us the ability to shoot in 4K 120. The a 7 has a 1.5 times crop when shooting in 4K 60, which is a pretty sizable crop. It was something I was always able to work around with no issue, but that is something to consider. I'm waiting for it to get dark enough to do the low light test and we're, uh, we're getting pretty close. But while we wait, let's briefly talk about the low light, high ISO performance differences between these two cameras. Both of these cameras have something that resembles a dual native ISO, which is gonna give us really good low light performance. That dual native ISO is something that allows us to have strong performance in regards to low noise and the colors being maintained even at those high ISOs. If you want to see how this dual native baseline ISO works in detail as well as seeing my go-to methods for getting good low light performance out of these Sony cameras, I'll link a video at the very end of this video so you can dive into that. Both the ZV-E1 and the A7 IV have different values for their dual ISO settings and I've done all of the hard work for you and have made guides for exactly how those ISO values are for both cameras in every single picture profile. And if you want a copy of those charts, I'll provide a link down below. You can check that out for free. All right, we're getting there. I'm about to show you some low light examples from both of these cameras at high ISOs. Oh, and this is the environment that we're going to be filming in. My best light source is a street light that's about 50 feet away. And I will not be doing any noise reduction in post. Let's take a look. As 
we look at the test footage from each camera at these high ISOs, I won't be showing the exact same ISO value. These cameras have different second baseline ISO values, which that second baseline ISO essentially resets the amount of noise present, and then noise is slowly introduced from there as we increase the ISO. That's important to note because like I mentioned, I'm not showing these cameras at the same exact ISO. That's not an apples to apples comparison, given that they have different ISO ranges and different second native baseline ISO values. But I am showing these two cameras at what I see to be the highest ISO that I would shoot in and still find the footage to be acceptable, which I think is a good real case practical look at how you can expect these cameras to perform at their higher ISO values. Overall, I'm impressed by both of these cameras and how they perform in low light situations while using higher ISOs. Moving into an extremely hot topic amongst these two cameras, overheating. In 72 degrees Fahrenheit, I got the ZV-E1 to shut down due to overheating at around 50 minutes. That was of continuous shooting recording in 4K, 24P, and XAVCS in 422 10-bit color. The screen was closed and arguably could have gone a bit longer if I had the screen open to allow for some heat dispersion. I have never had the a7 IV shut down due to overheating after long format continuous shooting and 422 10-bit color 4K 24P. This is likely due to a larger camera body allowing for more heat dispersion. Note on the ZV-E1, if you're recording in direct sunlight in ridiculously hot temperatures and higher frame rates like 60P or in something like XAVC SI, which is gonna require more out of the camera, you can probably get the shutdown a little bit sooner than what I just showed of that 50 minute shutdown time. Autofocus, this is a very easy one. They're both incredible and I have pure confidence in both of these cameras autofocus performance. The ZV-E1 does have a newer AI based autofocus that was introduced in the A7R5. But yeah, they're both exceptional. If you're getting something from this video and you're looking forward to some of the really interesting things we're about to take a look at, let me know by giving it a tap on the thumbs up to let me know to keep making videos just like this one. Moving into stabilization. They both have active stabilization, which does have a slight crop compared to standard stabilization. And I'd say that active stabilization is very usable for handheld shots, especially slow motion ones due to those being smoother by nature. The ZV-E1 has a newly introduced dynamic active stabilization, which is really impressive as far as stabilization goes. It does crop in by 30%, which is a pretty fair amount, so keep that in mind when using this stabilization setting. Here is what that looks like when you're vlogging at 17 millimeters and you apply that 30% crop. Also, the ZV-E1 is a true 4K image as opposed to the A7 IV, which downsamples from a 7K image, meaning that when we apply that 30% crop, with this dynamic active stabilization, the ZV-E1, you will have a slight loss in quality. Let's take a look at exactly how these two cameras look side by side and how they're rendering color. This is going to be in an ultra controlled environment with a gray background to show any color differences. I'm going to expose my skin tone to 70 IRE. We're going to be in 5600 Kelvin for the white balance because my key light is exactly 5600 Kelvin. I'm doing nothing in post. This is going to be in 4K XAVCS 24P 422 10-bit color. Here are the two sample clips side by side looking at the ZV-E1 versus the Sony A7 IV. Can you tell the difference? From a color perspective, I've noticed that the ZV-E1, at least for my skin tone, is near perfect straight out of camera as long as I nail the white balance and I generally prefer the colors coming from this camera as opposed to the A7 IV. The A7 IV has a bit of a green tint in the skin tone, which is easily correctable in post and is overall easy to color match between these two cameras. One other thing that I've noticed is that the a7 IV is a bit brighter globally, even when I expose to the exact same value for my skin tone, maybe just by like a third of a stop. And I think that is due to the cameras using just a little bit of a different ISO value to get the exact same exposure. If you want to get a bit of a closer look at those two clips, I'll provide a link down below. You can download them for free. They're going to be straight out of camera in S-Log3 so you can get a close eye on them. We're going to give one point to the ZV-E1 for video performance and a half a point to the a7 IV. It's my grading system for just generally being an overall strong performer in video.
Getting into the photo comparison between these two cameras, the first thing to talk about is gonna be overall megapixels. The ZV-E1 only has a 12 megapixel sensor for photos, whereas the a7 IV is coming in at 33 megapixels. What you're really gonna notice that is in cropping. So if you wanna maintain as much detail as possible when you heavily crop into your photo, a7 IV is gonna be a lot better here. Next point of interest for photo capabilities is gonna be frames per second. How many frames per second can these cameras shoot continuously? They both come into ties shooting in 10 frames per second in uncompressed raw. What about mechanical shutter? The ZV-E1 only has an electronic shutter. We do have the capability to add a shutter sound effect, which is kind of cool, but when you only have an electronic shutter, you have potential for having some banding in your photos. It's not guaranteed you're gonna have banding, but the potential is absolutely there. The a7 IV has both an electronic shutter as well as a mechanical shutter. In regards to an EVF, an electronic viewfinder, ZV-E1 only has the back of the screen as a display, no EVF on the ZV-E1, so you're gonna have to rely on the back of that screen. And in super bright situations, it's not gonna be ideal, although I do think it is usable. And the a7 IV has an exceptional EVF, which is an OLED TrueFinder EVF, which features a 3.68 million dot resolution. So in really bright situations, you're gonna be able to use that EVF and see every single detail in your photo to make sure you nail things like exposure and composition. So how does that break down in terms of which camera is best for photography. It's an easy one here. The a7 IV wins in literally every single category. That doesn't mean the ZV-E1 is bad for photography. I actually found myself liking the photos a lot. The colors are really nice, the focus is on point, and I can totally see myself using this camera for photography. We're about to review the key features between these two cameras. Interesting stuff coming up, and if you want to see more videos like this one, subscribe down below. I'd love to have you a part of the channel. Moving into a few of the key features to look at with these cameras. First is auto white balance balance lock. This feature allows you to let the camera get white balance on the scene while it's in auto white balance and then you can lock it off so that you don't experience any color shifting and both cameras have this feature. Taking a look at the screen, both cameras have a fully articulating screen but the ZV-E1 includes the ability to change things like ISO, aperture, shutter speed and more via the touch screen which is a nice feature especially when you're in vlog mode. In regards to brightness, neither are really great here compared compared to some of Sony's high-end cameras. The ZV-E1 has a 1,036,800 dots screen, and the a7 IV has a 1,036,800 dot screen. The menu system, both cameras have the updated menu system, which is a really big upgrade from their older menu system. So in this one, you can actually find things. Touch tracking, both cameras have this really nice touch tracking feature, and when you have the right auto focus settings, it works extremely well. Okay, so are these cameras key features the exact same? No, let's uh, let's take a look at some of the differences now. Auto framing, this one is unique to the ZV-E1 and it allows you to have the camera track and reframe a subject giving an effect like you are being filmed. Button customization, both of these cameras have the ability to customize the buttons. The a7 IV does have three dials in total versus the two on the ZV-E1 and the a7 IV also also has one more customizable button than the ZV-E1. The ZV-E1 does make up for this a bit though with having the touchscreen's ability to change ISO, shutter speed, aperture, white balance, which are usually things that you'd want to hotkey to custom buttons on the a7 IV. SD cards, the a7 IV has two slots where the ZV-E1 only has one. The ZV-E1 does let us put the card in though with the logo facing us, so Product showcase, this is also unique to the ZV-E1, which if you do a lot of product reviews, this can be really nice. It uses AI to recognize when you hold the product up in front of your face, it will prioritize focus on that product while it's directly in front of your face. And without this feature on, the camera will typically stay stuck on focusing on your face, in which case the product won't be in focus. Both cameras use Sony's FZ battery, which is an incredibly good battery. And in my experience, both cameras have a really similar battery. Life. User LUTs. We can upload and use LUTs directly in the ZV-E1, but not the A7 IV. This is a really nice feature if you want to see how your preferred LUT will manipulate the footage before you even start recording. HDMI ports. The ZV-E1 unfortunately uses the micro HDMI, which do have a tendency to break, whereas the A7 IV wins here with using a full-size HDMI port. Both cameras are completely weather sealed, which I was pleasantly 
pleasantly surprised to see them including in the ZV-E1. Cost. The Sony a7 IV is coming in at 2,499 US dollars and the ZV-E1 is slightly cheaper coming in at $2,200. And after looking at all those key features, which camera we're gonna give the point to, I'm going with the ZV-E1, which does make it the overall winner and might suggest that's the camera you should choose, but I think it's a bit more complicated than that. Here's my two cents. The ZV-E1 is gonna shine in video quality. I prefer the color, although we're splitting hairs, and it's small and compact. This camera is targeted to content creators and I think that's a perfect fit for who this camera is for. But it does have some downfalls. Photos, a7 IV is gonna crush it, but it's still pretty good. It only has one card slot, so pros who are looking aren't even looking at this camera. If you need to shoot redundancy, like once in a lifetime moments, you need two SD card slots. And anybody who needs to record or live stream for longer than an hour, probably should not get this camera due to the potential overheating. And then you have the a7 IV and where does it shine and who should consider that one? It's really great at a lot of things, especially if you want something that's exceptional with photos and really, really, really good with video, you might wanna get the a7 IV. Also, if you absolutely need two card slots, you're gonna want the a7 IV over the ZV E1. And the biggest downfall of the a7 IV is gonna be that, that large crop in 4K60. So if you absolutely need cropless slow motion 4K60, you want the ZV-E1. For me, what am I gonna be going with? I'm going with the a7 IV. If I had to pick just one, if I had to pick just one, I'm going with the a7 IV. I like more button customization. I'd like to have two card slots if I absolutely need it. I'd like to be able to rely on long format video recording and having the better photo capabilities is something that's important to me. And I used to love the colors that were coming out of the a7 IV before I came across the ZV-E1, but the a7 IV colors are still really good in my opinion. With the a7 IV, you certainly miss out on some of those cool new features that come in the ZV-E1, like the auto framing, the ability to import user LUTs, and of course, cropless 4K60 and soon to be 4K 120 slow motion footage. But all things considered, I'm going with the a7 IV if I had to pick just one. But my go-to, I'm gonna be keeping both of these cameras. I think they complement each other extremely well. The a7 IV will be my main driver for photos, as well as if I have a continuous shot that's longer than an hour just to be safe. And it also makes for a great second angle if my ZV-E1 is the main angle. And the ZV-E1 is gonna be my main camera for these type of videos. Anything that I wanna do 4K and cropless slow motion. Another reason why they complement each other so well is both cameras are full frame, so all your lenses are gonna be interchangeable amongst both cameras. If that section earlier where I talked about the low light performance amongst these cameras, if that got you thinking about, man, how do I get my low light footage to look that good? You wanna check out this video where I deep dive into just that using the Sony a7 IV. Anyways, I'll see you in the next one. Take care. See you.